And I will um, start by welcoming everyone to this meeting. I'm very sorry if there's confusion about time because I suspect um, some participants think it's six o'clock because of the change of time that just happened this weekend, uh, which explains uh, why there are less uh, uh, at people attending because most of our audience is from abroad. So I suspect that's the reason thinking it's six o'clock rather than five o'clock, you know, the, the confusion about uh, time change. However, let me briefly, uh, uh, first of all, welcome Shirin Zubair to be our speaker. My colleague Hatun will introduce you with more detail in a minute and then introduce uh, or say something very brief about the series. Uh, obviously the aim or the main aim of this series is to explore the, imagina the imagination and representations of uh, men and women and as well as avenues of empowerment through the arts, literature and activism with its multifarious forms and shapes. Our aim is to extend this platform to as many regions as possible across the globe, be that in terms of our speakers or our audience and participants. We also aim to open this platform to academics of all ranks and levels, as well as activists and the general public. We are really pleased to see us moving into the second round of this forum and assuring to bring to the fore new voices to represent new regions, as is the case today with our speaker coming all the way from Pakistan uh, whom uh, my colleague uh, is going to introduce right away. Go ahead, uh, Adun. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, as uh, Professor Zahia said, it's uh, our, our uh, second round, and this is the second lecture actually of, of this round. Um, our speaker today is Professor Shirin Zubair. Um, who is a professor of English and linguistics uh, from Pakistan. She taught for over three decades uh, in uh, uh, universities in uh, Punjab and uh, Lahore, such as Bahauddin Bahu Zakaria uh, University and um, Kinarid College for Women in Pakistan. Uh, she has received so many um, fellowships uh, to, uh, to run projects on Pakistani women's literacies and identities, one from University of Texas, Austin, USA, one from uh, Lenai University in Pennsylvania, from Central College, Iowa, uh, from uh, um, uh, University of Oslo, uh, Norway, um, Kate Hamburger uh, College from Berlin, from Freie University, Germany. Uh, and at the moment she is uh, working at the Polish Institute of Advanced uh, Studies as a senior fellow, researching on the emergence of women's marches in Pakistan in recent years. Um, her, um, uh, her work is based on, is, is all about, is about linguistics, but uh, with the uh, concentration on feminist formation, South Asian popular culture, um, on um, uh, uh, women's uh, literature uh, and writing. Um, so I will uh, leave the give the floor now to Shireen and uh, the PowerPoint to be shown. Uh, and you have 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah, we're starting late. Thank you very much for inviting me to this forum and very significant forum in terms of women's empowerment and women's writings. Um, and uh, thank you for this introduction. So I, first of all, I've changed, I, I would let you know that I've tweaked the title a little bit uh, from what it was, uh, from what was advertised. So um, now it is reconstructing Pakistan. Um, uh, yeah, through women's art and her story, an alternative perspective. So. I have, uh, and uh, to bring it into um, um, line with the theme of the series, as well as to capture what my theme is, I draw on the uh, 
Morgan's Robin Morgan's concept of her story uh, from her anthology Sex Sisterhood is Powerful, which has been widely credited with helping to start the second wave feminist movement in the United States and was cited by the New York Public Library as one of the most hundred most influential books of the 20th century. She writes that she wrote that the women's liberation movement was creating history or her story. So coining the popular term that second wave feminists used to highlight the way in which women were consistently overlooked in historical narratives. Some of, and I'm citing some of the memoirs by Pakistani women writers um, in today's talk, uh, written in a historical standpoint to showcase and problematize the experiences of women who had been silenced in the erstwhile historical accounts. And also Pakistani women, and to show that the significance of Pakistani women's memoirs and writings as significant writings and documents uh, in, in terms of feminist writings from the global south. So in today's talk, I will present and discuss some uh, works of a few Pakistani women poets, memoirists, as well as painters or graffiti artists to illustrate how the political silencing of women in this region has been challenged by Pakistani women writers, painters, and activists who are rewriting history, challenging the dominant Western paradigms and narratives and also indigenous political, socio-political discourses while interviewing the personal with the political. Um, the main themes or the main questions that I address in this talk would be, which forms of new forms of cultural, literary and linguistic expressions have emerged for Pakistani women locally and internationally? And how are Western norms and indigenous literary genres challenged and changed in their perspective, in their writings? So uh, women's um, writings are also linked to women's literacy and education. And uh, over the years or recent decades, the more access to literacy and higher education has opened new avenues of literary and cultural expression for Pakistani women, which challenge the tradition of silence through women's narratives. For instance, uh, feminist poets like Kishwar Nahid and um, memoirists like Fawzia Abdul Khan, Tehmina Durani, Malala Yousafzai, and digital art painters like Shazil Malik. These are some of the names, that, that were some of the artists and writers that I've been talking about and uh, with examples from their works. Um, in today's talk and how these um, uh, forms of art and expression have given, uh, can you go back a slide please? Can you go back two slides? Yeah, how the, yes, in a decolonial perspective, it's very important to uh, see, I'm going to see them in, a, yes. So in a way, these are redefining their identities in a decolonial perspective, which is uh, um, which um, which emerges a decolonial perspective emerges in opposition to the assumption that Western or Eurocentric cultural paradigms and narratives are the primary and only ways of looking at the world. That English is the only language, the only lingua franca. That subordinates all others and that Western culture is primary framework for interpretation. So a decolonial perspective critiques imperialism and colonialism and promotes indigenous perspectives and while also constructing alternative identities for these women from Pakistan. While constructing alternate and diverse identities also writes back to the Western monolith construct of Muslim women oh, oh, as uh, uh, oppressed, backward, and illiterate in Mohanty's terms. These writings that I am going to discuss today by some well-known and relatively lesser known women writers uh, are 
viewed as a way of finding their own distinct and diverse voices through experimentation with literary genres, for instance, in the works of Fawzia Afzal Khan and Parveen Shakir, and also um, breaking the taboos in terms, for instance, the theme of female sexuality and agency in Parveen Shakir's Urdu poetry, then voices of political dissent in Fawzia Afzal Khan's memoir and their resistance during Zia's military dictatorship in the poetry of Kishwar Nahid and Femida Riaz, and also incorporating literacy in their representations, while also, which also ruptures the um, literacy myth, which is a kind of a autonomous model of literacy, which leads to empowerment and development automatically. So this is a this is a Eurocentric model of literacy, which has also been challenged in these writings. So in this way, then uh, they they are. I I hope to be able to illustrate that through these writings, these writings are a way of establishing an alternate female literary canon to capture the feminine sensibilities or feminist poetics, and I borrow these, some of these uh, feminist poetics. The term is borrowed from Chowalter's very uh, influential feminist uh, literary criticism. To, um, to represent women, whereas women had always been represented or written about by male writers through a man-made language. So here we get to see women experimenting with structures, not only with the macro structures of society, but also with the uh, themes, genres, and um, micro structures within the um, literary, uh, literary writings or literary conventions. So the first book that I'm, or the memoir, which I think everyone would be familiar with, perhaps if not with the book itself, but perhaps with the author, which is Malala Yousafzai, who's very well known in the West. So her memoir, I am Malala, the girl shot by the Taliban. But however, I'm going to look it, at it in a very different perspective, in a, in a decolonial uh, perspective or in a decolonial way. Because as Spivak has observed, a decolonial perspective offers a valid approach to reading Yusuf Zai's memoir because of her position as a Muslim woman from Pakistan, a marginalized um, subject. So the, uh, uh, the, about Malala and her representations in the Western media, there are contrasting perceptions in, in terms of uh, the perception in the West and in the Pakistani media. So here I'm not focusing on her perceptions, but if there is a question later, maybe I can address that. But I'm not at, uh, looking at the representations in the Pakistani media, but her own representations of literacy and her selfhood in her memoir, as well as her uh, representations by the Western media. The Western media has idolized her as a victim of a society hostile towards women. And particularly the New York Times repeatedly addressed Malala as the girl shot by the Taliban and other media represent her as the girl saved from a savage people. The problem with these representations is as per the women's studies scholars who are say like Emily Bent, they argue that these depictions reinforce a colonial power structure through the dangerous images these construct of a third world and a third world vulnerability. And they promote their own agendas rather than seeing Malala in her own right. For instance, such representations conveniently ignore how critically she engages with American policies in this region. The drone attacks, the U United States war on terror resulting in civilian deaths. Some example which cast doubt on claims that she promotes Eurocentric ideals and agendas. How she incorporates literacy in her book also upsets the Eurocentric claims. And I'll give some examples. When the book is read as a literacy narrative, a story that foregrounds issues of language and literacy, the book presents an alternative or several little or parallel narratives to the grand master narrative of 
literacy as an independent variable or a set of neutral skills that lead to single direction of literacy and development. The book promotes literacy as a collective, a universal achievement situated within a cultural ecology of literacy that is linked to social, cultural and political power structures and contexts. So her little, her narratives, uh, there are several narratives. There are, she brings multiple narratives to her story, telling the story. Uh, and these narratives emphasize cooperation instead of competition in the context and, and kinship to illustrate how non-Western cultures like a Pakistani culture tend to value communal authority and responsibility over individual success. She situates her story within the frameworks and values that she upholds, which disrupt the colonial perspective. Her narratives come, uh, narrative comes across as a powerful voice, which considers and evaluates her own cultural traditions while representing alternative understandings of literacy, her, um, herself and her culture. By doing so, she not only draws on a vastly different cultural framework than those that follow the Western or Eurocentric ideals, she thus repositions herself not to promote the Western agendas or, de or to demonize Taliban, Pakistan, Islam and gender roles, but as a powerful voice who reclaims her culture, history, language and literacy practices. Her writing guides the readers towards how the readers are to perceive the events that occur, thus upsetting the dominant narratives. So the, when talking about the multiple um, uh, voices that she brings to the, I give you an example. By narrating the shooting incident, for in, instance, and its aftermath, she was unconscious for weeks afterwards. So she relies, while narrating her, the incident in, the, in her memoir, she relies on the voices of others to offer details, which include the voices of mm, several people like her van driver, her friends, her doctor, and her parents. So all these voices and viewpoints give the text a polyphonic um, texture. It makes it a collective text, which again challenges the autonomous view or model of literacy as an individualistic and monolithic enterprise. And then her take on Islam and women's roles. She stresses on more expansive understandings of literacy, Islam, and women's roles. Her memoir includes numerous examples to argue that girls should be able to attend school just as boys, not because it will lead to individual success, but because it will enhance the lives of individuals and communities. She writes that education, educating girls not only brings individual agency within a communal context, but more than that can contribute meaningfully towards the development and prosperity of families, communities, and nations. There she shares many stories about her family's educational background to show that literacy and schooling have long been important values in her culture. Thus dispelling the racist assumptions of ignorance. She also demonstrates her love for Islam. Unlike the Western media portrayals, she embraces both the progressive and conservative. So now um, I move on to the, my second um, example. On, yes, uh, which is um, um, Fazia Abdel Khan's Lahore, with, which is now a relatively lesser known uh, writing. Uh, it's a memoir by um, Pakistani American uh, educationist. Uh, professor of English and Gender Studies at the at Montclair State University. It's titled Lahore with Love, Growing Up with Girlfriends, Pakistani Style. And um, I will use this as an example of um, how Lahore with Love denotes a reenactment of history from a feminist stance 
and thereby establishing Pakistani her story. Her, uh, her Afzal and Afzal Khan's her story gives voice to women, but it does not silence men at the same time. She presents a comprehensive view via her story. Instead of an archetypal male hero, her girlfriends, and I put the girlfriends in inverted commas because this is an appropriation of the English language itself. Girlfriends in this sense, do the, the, the word does not have the uh, romantic um, uh, connotations or denotations, uh, which is the usual English, use, standard English usage mm -hmm. as. So it's only, it means uh, friends who are uh, women in this context. So these friends uh, are protagonists in the memoir. And there are several narratives. Each story, uh, each friend's story is told in several chapters in, in, in her memoir. But the interesting thing about this memoir is that it um, affirms the presence of the female sex in a historical narrative and mingles the personal with the political. The, the, and Pakistani style evokes the need for a study on the alternative perspective of her story where Pakistan's religious discourse, gender discrimination and class stratification is unveiled as a form of militarism the Pakistani style is reflected in her story as a true depiction of totalitarianism and its impact on women, her girlfriends. So um, here uh, there are several stories, her stories in Lahore with Love, and um, it's a holistic analysis of Pakistan's socio-political history. Through analysis of the various history, uh, her stories of her friends, each vignette of a friend's voices lends a different vantage point that reflects the major events in Pakistan's history and how these events impact on her friends individually. The socio-political ambience and class structures of the 70s followed by Ziya's Islamization in the 1980s have been dismantled to propose an alternative feminist point of view. The metaphor forces in each character is portrayed through their stories that subsequently revealed the construction of an alternate female identity as a defense mechanism to challenge the phallocentric norms. Now, in the preface to this book, she writes, Abzal Khan uses, she writes that I was born, and I quote, I was born at the end of the 1950s, almost exactly a decade after the inception of my country, Pakistan. Her inception recorded along with the nation's birth is an immediate mingling of a female in history. She associates her inception with that of the country, which is the start of a new narrative pertaining to Pakistan. This new narrative is her story. The protagonist claims that Pakistan is my, my older sister and that we have become, uh, we have come of age together. So uh, that's how, how the story unfolds. Each story unfolds and each story parallels a historical ev event in Pakistan's history. So she also takes up taboos, taboos, she uh, taboo topics or uh, subjects, and she uses these topics to defy societal notions of shame attached to women's bodies. Damn if I, and I quote, this is from quote from her text, damn if I, uh, I let the blood between my legs ever rob me of my strength." Unquote. She describes her, quote, fateful encounter with female blood oozing out uncontrollably, big dark clots popping, popping out of Hajira as she sits, sits, sorry, sits on her pink girly potty, unquote. She creates this vivid visual imagery of menstrual blood through the mention of big dark clots combined with auditory images in the form of plopping sound. The author, by highlighting such taboos associated with menstruation, attempts to rise above the socially dictated forms of narrative and thereby maintains her individuality by writing about women's bodies, but also at the same simultaneously, the onset of menstruation is paralleled with a political narrative about the 1971 war with East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, 
where references of bloodshed are associated with death. Wow. Afzal Khan parallels her story, the story of Hajra, her friend, mm -hmm. with the history of her nation, bringing together personal concerns and political ones by describing the separation of East Pakistan and the, quote, the role of Pakistani army in looting, killing, raping the other side of India, unquote. Therefore, in this chapter, the image of blood carries contrasting meanings, suggesting both life and death. Now, Hajra, about, about whom this chapter is about, is her introduction. This is her introduction. And this introduction begins and ends in blood. It foreshadows what awaits her. She exercises her agency by refusing to accept the docile role of a wife and commits suicide. The author views it as a kind of rebellion, just as Samina, her other friend from, the, from lower middle class, defies the societal norms by falling in love. Quote, her beloved was a participant of the civil war of 1971. Unquote. She shares that Quote, thousands of East Pakistanis were dead butchered by their West Pakistani brothers, unquote. While the Pakistanis blamed the evil Indians who wanted to tear our East Pakistan away from us. So there, to show that how the political narrative is intertwined with the stories, each one of a friend's stories. Then, as I mentioned about the taboo subject and particularly to write about women's bodies is but a, a taboo particularly for women. Men can write in, in, in traditionally in Urdu literature as, as well. Mm -hmm. Men write about women and their bodies, but women are not uh, supposed to write about their own bodies. So their bodies are associated or uh, they are considered rather repositories of male honor or izzat as the word is in Urdu. They are also associated with shame. However, women themselves must not use such language. Her use of expletives itself is a very bold and revolutionary stance for a Pakistani woman, as is her confession of having a fling with Bakiri in Bath, the UK, when she was a married woman. Similarly, she also mentions in passing her mother's extramarital liaison with one of her uncles, while she was a, which she was a witness to during her youth. This is somewhat similar to Tehnina Durrani's autobiography, where, um, she, uh, where she spills the beans about her own extramarital affair with the governor of the Punjab, which consequently led to her divorce and marrying him. She also elaborates how after marrying the man following a tumultuous affair, she soon discovered him to be an un abusive and unfaithful husband. How much time is that? That's why I'm rushing through the slides how much time is left you have another 10 minutes that's 10 fine. minutes so i, I yeah. better be quick so uh, yeah so she talks about her husband incestuous no can can i just want to finish that is interesting because it's a mm -hmm. this uh, she stood she wrote the she stood her ground and she wrote her autobiography and three decades ago which it was a huge uh controversy controversy in that in those times and but she emerged as empowered when she won accolades internationally for writing. It's been translated into many languages as well. And she emerged as a successful woman for writing a groundbreaking memoir, not only about her life, own life, but as an indictment of the feudal Pakistani society, which mm -hmm. forbids women to speak their truth or to tell their stories. So now I, I, I'll just skip that. This is about experimentation with the uh, language, with word structures, with the hyphenated words and sentences. And I just skip that, that's too long. And there's also genre mixing and code mixing in Lahore with love. And also the expletives, like people who understand the language would know, for instance, in a Shiite procession during the, uh, um, month of um, Muharram in um, her memoir, Abdul Khan writes about these uh, insults, uh, how men, how we, men um, uh, lang in the, in the, she cites indigenous abuses in Urdu language like behen chod, mother chod, are, are, don't you have mothers and sisters, you fucking sons of bitches. 
and yet it, it paints a picture of a Shia procession showing reverence for their women, saying, Aram se bhai ye hamari behne hai, which translates, take care, these are our sisters. So her incorporation of such expletive, uh, like which, which translate I motherfucker, sister fucker, and at the same time, sisters, take care, these are our <laughs> sisters. So simultaneous construction of such identities where it shows a society where respect for the female is not based on her own individuality, but based on their relationship with a male kin. So it, language itself is also deconstructed and it becomes as it becomes an emblem, at, emblem of patriarchal structures. I am going very quickly now because I want to show you some visuals of the artist and some more examples. What do you suggest we do? Slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Next. Let's skip this. To, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, this is a poem by Parveen Shakir, um, who's a leading uh, feminist contemporary poet. And she, um, she also uh, experimented with uh, the subject of female sexuality. It's a very untraditional poem. It's for in, um, because it was a taboo for women. As I said, women were represented mm -hmm. by men. And yes. they were, and also the traditional Urdu genre of ghazal meant literally men talking to women. Whereas if women had to write liter literature or poetry, they would do, uh, I'm talking about 200 years ago, not now, not in mm -hmm. recent decades, but she was the first one around three, four decades ago. She um, experimented with genres and she experimented with the subject matter of uh, Urdu poetry by incorporating female desire and female sexuality into her uh, works. And this is one of her poems where it was a taboo for uh, women to talk about their feelings. And she, therefore she is re uh, remembered as a trendsetter in Urdu poetry. Here she gives voice to the need to break the rules and transcend boundaries to fulfill personal desire. And the next is an, another poem. I'm not going to read the poem because I, I think it's, time is running. It's free play of body moods and then working woman. And these are translated by, these poems have been translated by a scholar called Sobhya Kiran and they were originally in Urdu. Now, this is a poem by a working woman who is strong, and I just quickly read it, but she's, um, all admit it's a matter of pride. I fed my vibrance on my blood, all my leaves full of vitality. I have earned, not a petal owes to wind or rain. I will bloom whenever I will. My personality is my discovery. I face all seasons with head high. I'm a strong tree, discovering the possibilities of my fertile growth, but, in strong wind, a vine in me wants to stick to a strong big tree. So she has played and portrayed various roles and talked about various problems of women in patriarchal society. She also wrote about other modes of oppression like feudalism and capitalism, which aggravate the misery of women. She also wrote against dictatorship. She emerged as a powerful woman, ready to defy social and literary taboos and conventions. She also uh, broke away with literary tradition using blank words at a time when it was looked down upon in Urdu literature. She also used bilingual expressions using English, incorporating English words in Urdu poetry and going against the literary canon of her times. And next is, this is a poem, We Sinful Women. Perhaps people are familiar with this because it has been translated in many languages across mm -hmm. the continent. It's by one of the leading feminist poets of Pakistan, Kishwar Nahid. And it's a poem which was written during the military dictatorship of General Ziaul Haq in the 80s, in the early 80s. It encapsulates the Pakistani women's resistance against the imposition of Hatud ordinance and Sharia laws during the military dictator's rule under the guise of Islamization. In a true feminist spirit of defiance against patriarchal structures, it challenges the authority of the male clergy over religious jurisprudence as during the Islamization of the early 1980s, Yah had given immense power to the Council of Islamic Ideology 
which used religion to single out and punish the sinful or deviant women. Now, sinful, I'm in quote, <laughs> I is my inverted commas, because uh, those women who dare to understand, interpret, or practice their religion differently from the male clergy, those who dare to differ to the dictator of imposition of an Arabized version of Islam, particularly in relation to women's dress codes, women's witness law, rape law, etc., etc., were deemed sinful or bad women. The collective we in the title here signifies the solidarity and the women's collective voice against such patriarchal and oppressive structures. So I just quickly go through this. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, we, who don't sell our lives, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. It is we sinful women, while those who sell the harvests of our bodies become exalted, become distinguished, become the just princes of the material world. It is we sinful women who come out raising the banner of truth up against barricades of lies on the highways, who find stories of persecution piled up on piled on each threshold, who find that tongues who could speak have been severed. It is we sinful women. Now, even if the night gives chase, these eyes shall not be put out for the wall which has been raised. Don't insist now on raising it again. It is we sinful women who... We don't sell our bodies, we don't bow our heads, we don't fold our hands together. And then her biography, autobiography or her memoir is titled A Bad Woman Story. And like the sinful woman, the bad woman, the epithet bad woman in the title deconstructs the normative construction of good and bad women in Pakistani society. The memoir begins with a rhetorical question. Who did Eve narrate her story to? And then it continues to give instances of different women from history, myths, and religions whose stories have been narrated by others and who are judged and punished by others since the inception of this world. Her memoir reiterates women's desire and the need to take charge and narrate their own story. I will tell my story and let us tell our tale. So now the last example is of a and I want to show you some posters of Shahzal Malik and, uh, and her graffiti. And, but she's not the least as she is associated with women's marches, which are called Aurat. Aurat, I don't know people who speak Arabic, maybe Aurat, maybe they're familiar with the term, it means woman. Women's marches since 2018 have emerged. Aura, Aura. Aura, yes, Aurat, uh, women marches. And they have emerged in Pakistani major cities since 2018. And she is associated with the women's march, her art. And her posters and street art or graffiti, they are spread across the cities in Pakistan. Yes, this is an, an image of, um, and it also reappropriates the cultural signifiers, her art reappropriates the cultural signifiers of dress codes and how a woman should behave dress and uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, for the and also they are spread across the country in the cities they are pasted on the walls in the streets and they are also available on her website where women and girl download can download the artwork off the net and spread the word by talking to people and paste, pasting these flyers at schools, universities, to uh, bus stops, offices, and in streets during the to promote the women's marches to to promote women's cause and yeah please next please her art um, so uh, it's uh, and also there's a uh, clothing line as well where the similar images are so riding a bike with a, a with her legs up, uh, apart is kind of quite. Uh, uh, and with, uh, in, with this kind of dress code that is not very traditional. Um, yeah. it's, it's a graffiti in the street. And then her art has also been used in the first Muslim superhero, Ms. Marvel by Marvel Studios mm -hmm. in the Disney star. And so there's the artwork. She, she's going international with this kind of depictions in mm -hmm. her um, art, a digital art also. And then, um, yeah. So these are on the, 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 to raise awareness about women's marches also, and to raise awareness among those women 
who do not have access to uh, liter formal literacy. So in the informal sector also, this, these are used by activists uh, uh, who are associated with women. women marches, activists, they use these posters to educate the women in the informal sector and to raise awareness about women's rights, about the women's movements. So this artwork has now become synonymous with the resurgence of women's movement in Pakistan. And for the past two years, the posters have been freely available in the further in. And I downloaded these images from her website. Uh, they were they are pasted in the walls and the shared on the social media and now also being studied by scholars for their symbolism. Scholars like myself, they are being studied for their political thought and for their symbolism. This one I wanted to, um, yeah, this one, because here, you know, the next one, please. The next one. That's one. No, no, yeah. The, the previous one. Uh, this one, this one. This is, uh, is all this because she is, uh, this is, she's dressed differently and there's different, the reappro, this kind of semiotic disruption is a visual disruption to the, and how women are reappropriating these cultural signifiers of dress codes, of behavioral codes, and uh, in terms of um, their dress, as well as is my shirt not, and what is written all over her is my, is my, because the tight fitting clothes, are they revealing her um, body shape too much, or is her head covered, is my, so all these, so, um, here, here they, these, uh, semiotics are disrupting the cultural signifiers for women, and here they are reappropriating these symbols. It's my reading, though, so maybe it's, uh, mm -hmm. you can. Have. I just conclude quickly now. I hope it has. Uh, I am glad that it worked, and we were able here in the informal sector. They, these um, the activists go just to conclude quickly, and then open it to questions and comments. Shall I stop share? Yes, please. It's okay. Yes. These writings uh, uh, are the memoirs. They remain on the periphery. Still, they remain on the periphery, although there are implications for social change here. And they are significant in uh, reappropriating the, uh, um, the Western or Eurocentric um, paradigms about Muslim women or they deconstruct the local indigenous cultural norms as well regarding their roles and identities, but they still remain uh, on the periphery because of the structural inequalities pertaining to gender representation within the academy and the, at the higher policy making levels in Pakistan. It was during the Benazir Bhutto's uh, regime that for the, in the 90, early 19, I think it was in 1990s, or I'm, I'm not sure about the exact date, but in her first regime, that Pakistan, uh, there were departments of gender studies were introduced at Pakistani universities, but they still remain dominated by male professors due to women's. Um, now there are more women in my age, <laughs> but then we were the first generation who, were, who went to the level of, who, ro who rose to the level of professorship or chairpersonship but mostly it's about the male uh, professors and policy makers. So this is very hard to, to this day to include such writings and women's art in curricula because this can bring about social change and it can, women engage with the, it can, women can, these writings have, in my view, have the potential to bring about significant change in women thinking and their social and political roles by engaging with these issues. I think I, I think that's all I have to say and I, it's more important to have comments and questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Shireen. This is uh, such a, an illuminating lecture and, and speaking about the arts and the literature of women in Pakistan and how they are using these uh, mediums as uh, platforms for their activism and also for gaining empowerment is really, uh, uh, I would say, insightful. It's not something that everyone hears about. And I also uh, personally enjoyed listening to your reading of Malala's uh, memoir, which is a different uh, 
version or a different interpretation from the one that's in the mainstream uh, media. So um, I think I think we should just uh, open the floor to our uh, participants. I'm sure they have comments, questions they would like to contribute with. So please just you, uh, raise your hand. You can use the reactions, I think. Uh, yes, the reactions. To do the, um, yeah, to raise yeah, your hand and we'll, we'll invite you to speak. Uh, Shireen, this was very, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, listening to you speaking about Pakistani women makes you feel, uh, as a Saudi woman, uh, that, um, well, I'm not uh, a stranger, a stranger to your society. Mm -hmm. um, everything that um, uh, those women were facing or speaking about or uh, um, suffering from are just similar. So we are mm -hmm. just living in the same, more or less the same circumstances. And uh, I really hail a uh, Pakistani woman for the effort they, they did. I, I have a, a small question regarding um, the, the difference of uh, uh, representation of, uh, of, of, of those, who, uh, Malala, for example, or uh, the other writers. You said that uh, she's perceived in a different way in the, in the Pakistani um, uh, media from um, the, the American. So how is she perceived in, in uh, like in, uh, in Pakistan? Okay, thank you uh, for your question and your interest. Um, well, actually she was a hero. Once uh, she was shot initially, she was a hero and uh, all over Pakistan and women, uh, girls in school, from schools and colleges, they were hailing her as their hero. They were um, lighting candles for her and everything. And the media was very appreciative of her as a brave girl. But when the West espoused her, if I may use the expression, uh, she was flown out of the country soon after, while she was still mm -hmm. unconscious, she was flown to the United Kingdom. And then later as the West, um, as she was made into a victim, I, I mean, all these Western representation and when she was given uh, political asylum or uh, whatever status that she was in. The, uh, and she was the hero of the, she was speaking to the United Nations and she was, she her biography, autobiography, it came out in soon after, I think um, a year after she was assessed, uh, sorry, she was shot. So uh, then it, when it, she was espoused by the Western media or the Western powers, the perception of our local media changed um, suddenly everyone and the society since the Pakistani society is a um, very polarized society and she was viewed as a uh, by majority of the in the majority of the local uh, media representations in Pakistan she is viewed as a as an agent of the western as a uh, ideology and to, that she is uh, she has been picked by the west because she uh, she uh, promotes the Western ideals or the Western ideologies and therefore she has been, so she has to, she, it was all, and they, they went on to the extent of saying because of the clergy as well, the influence of the clergy in the, in Pakistani society, uh, they went on and there's also this anti-West sentiment that it, that dominates, it, it still dominates in, it's a very populist sentiment in the country like Pakistan uh, where there is uh, anti-American in particular, not the West, uh, all the West, but particularly uh, in, uh, in relation to America, this anti-American sentiment. So they played up this anti-West, anti-American sentiment. So she's viewed as a, now as an outsider. She sides with the, this, uh, <laughs> the, the big bad West. <laughs> And also, this is a popular perception. The common perception is also divided in the country. I mean, people, some appreciate her, some do. Some are deadly against mm -hmm. her because she sold her story to the West. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it, it's, it's very uh, telling that such stories have a, a, an immense longevity because, I mean, if you look into... Uh, as Hatun said, she doesn't feel a stranger coming from Saudi Arabia. I don't feel a stranger either coming from Algeria. 
because the stories you are telling are very common in uh, across the Muslim world, across the Middle East and North Africa. But again, what, what strikes me is the longevity of these myths. For example, saving Malala uh, as one mm. person, one girl, does mm. it save all the girls, all the women? Does it change the status quo? Does it change the position of the Taliban towards women? Um, and saving one person does not really save her, but uh, it damages her, like you explained. And it's very interesting that in the uh, 19th century, when the French were in Algeria, they had campaigns such as these. In fact, there was in, uh, in the book uh, by Hubertine Auclair, the French feminist who, in fact, coined the word feminism. She came to Algeria looking for one woman or one girl uh, to save in Algeria and take her to France in order for her to be educated, to become a doctor. And she spent a couple of years searching for this ideal girl and she couldn't find her because nobody wanted their daughter to become this saved girl amongst millions. So mm. uh, this saving conception really doesn't do uh, a service uh, to women, but damages them and, and, and Damage is their community, not just them as individuals. Mm. Mm. So, I uh, have a, a, an intervention. Yes, uh, Amina, please uh, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Shireen. That was a. Sorry, I think I just. Can you introduce it. yourself a little? Uh, a little <laughs> introduction would do. Oh, okay. Um, I'm a PhD uh, student uh, at Glasgow University in Scotland. Um, I'm researching um, uh, Sufi poetry and um, how that relates to Islamic feminism and um, ideas around gender and how those stories have either facilitated or hindered um, gender empowerment, um, particularly in South Asia. Um, yeah, I really liked your, um, your presentation. Um, I guess just on the back of what Zahia was saying, um, I think I think the Malala story is particularly unique um, in amongst some of the, the other stories that you, you mm. presented. Um, and I can see a point about, because you you know, you, you kind of initially framed uh, the discussion around decolonization. And, and mm. I think one of the issues maybe is that with Malala's book in particular, um, in terms of who where it was published and who published it and also who the who who was the intended audience um because i don't think it was women in pakistan that she was writing for um mm -hmm. so i think that's yeah. perhaps where it becomes a little bit confusing in terms of you know is she just a poster child for um for this and i think in terms of you know people ethnic minorities and who gets published it it's always interesting to look at well what what stories are they telling? You know, um, I mean, had she not had that story, had she had a different story altogether, would she have been picked up for publication? Um, but in 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 relation to the other writers you were speaking about, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how they've been received in Pakistan itself, uh, in terms of like. You mean Fazia, Fazia Selkan, the Lahore with love. Lahore with love, um, and even um, Barveen Shakur and thing, you know, at the time, uh, what was the reaction of the general general population? Uh, was there a gender divide in terms of the reaction? Um, yeah, if you could speak a bit about that, would be helpful. Yeah, thank you uh, for your comment and for your question. So, uh, uh, about first about Malala's, uh, uh, and also about. Shireen, yeah. can I interrupt if I may? Because there is another question about Malala, then maybe you could possibly. Yeah, there was, the I think, time. from Amal. Man, Amal. Can you re yeah, can you see that question from Amal Mazouz? Or do you want uh, to speak, Amal? Yeah, they, I, I haven't read it yet because I was listening. Maybe to she can Amina's speak quickly. Yes, go on, yeah, Amal. Yes, go on. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Oh, good, good. Because I, I was having problems with my mic. That's why I just put it in the chat. Sorry. Uh, first, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. So my PhD is about the representation of Muslim women. And one of the texts I'm working on is uh, Malala's text, I am Malala. So mm -hmm. um, there's so much, so many resources available about her. And I, I just couldn't help to think that um, her text has been just um, like, 
appropriated. And so I feel that her, her voice has been hijacked in order to justify Western uh, interference in Pakistan. So it's all for political uh, agendas. And then there's also her father and there's a whole like whole chapter about her father. And then there's another book that he himself wrote called uh, Let Her Fly. So her father is always, I feel like he's in the middle. <laughs> like, so I feel like also he also hijacks her voice. So I wanted to know what you think about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I first Amina's before I forget to make, and now I have your question written right in front of me. So it's about her father influence. Uh, um, yeah, it was written, it was uh, co written with Christina Lamb. Mm -hmm. Malala's um, biography was she was only, I think, 13 or 14 when it came out mm -hmm. in 2014 or 13. The, it was published. So the other question, yes, you wanted to know about the reception of these women's works in Pakistan. So about Malala, I'm not sure. Uh, Malala, well, interestingly, Malala's autobiography is not is banned in Pakistan. <laughs> so uh, yes, to be honest, in, in educational institutions, and, and there has been protest. If you talk about Malala in her autobiography, I have been able to talk about Malala at international fora and in the Western universities in Germany, for instance. Uh, but uh, in Pakistan, you have to be very careful. As I was saying, that unfortunately, this is not the case. About the other, and also about the you you were talking about the colonial and decolonial perspectives. In the, I, I'm not sure. I've lost the point. But I think what when you talk about Malala, yeah, you said it. She was writing for a different audience. She was not writing for pa a Pakistani or the audience. Perhaps he was writing to the West, and that is an uh, also an accusation. Perhaps or it's a kind of a criticism, not an accusation. It's a critique of, for instance, Fazia Abdul Khan, who's again. Uh, Lahore with Love is banned in Pakistan. I do not know the current status of the book, but I have taught it in my women's studies uh, module, but women's writings, I designed a module to teach on women's writings and memoirs, and I included Muslim women's memoirs, and I included that, but it was banned at a particular point in time in uh, Fazia Afzal Khan's, because she is too critical of Pakistani military. And their uh, yeah, and also about the uh, yeah, it's political basically. She it was banned. And the other thing is that because of the literacy rate, literacy rates are so low. How many people get to read those books in English? These are books by writers like who are uh, settled in the West. Uh, the this is the diaspora writing to the Western audience. So this is a, a critique against them. I, um, so Fazi Afzal Khan is not very well known. Her memoir is not very well known in Pakistan in particular because one reason, main reason is that she writes in English and very few people, I mean, if you compare, if you look at the literacy rates and how many people are conversant in the language and would read such memoirs and particularly by a woman writer. So yeah, this is a particular, it's written for a particular audience and she admits in her preface also the uh, particular for the Abdul Khan that she is she says that I'm she says Lahore and actually I, I didn't have the time Lahore and she plays upon the word in the Spanish uh, connotations Lahore the the whore la means the in Spanish perhaps and if I'm right so the whore so she compares herself with the whore who is selling her, you know, uh, knowledge and her abilities to read and write and her literacy and uh, the, her academic status in the West to climb up the uh, ladder, the, the ladder of success. So she admits to this kind of ambivalence that is there in, in such writings, uh, whether they are writing to the West or writing for the local audience. But in the local, as I said, th these two books are banned. About the uh, women writers who have written in Pakistani languages, they have been very well received, and but uh, 
well, it depends. There's no controversy as far as Parveen Shakir is concerned. There hasn't been any controversy regarding her work. She is, uh, as, is an acclaimed uh, writer, a trendsetter, a poet. She's not a writer, a poet, uh, and a, a trendsetter in her own right. So she was very well received by the literary circles and people who read literature. Um, very popular also. For other reasons, I mean, she was then she appeared for the civil services. If you are familiar with her, I don't know how, if you are familiar at all with Parveen Shakir's work. Um, she was a civil servant and she was working for bureaucracy and she was a very attractive young woman. I mean, she died at the age of 42 in a car accident. She was very popular. Visually, she was a very pleasant to look at and she was, there is a tradition of uh, Mushairas. Mushaira is an Urdu, it's Mushaira, a kind of... yes. Not, yes. Mushaira in Arabic. Yes. All right. No, 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 no. Yes. Yeah, where, Mushariba, where poets, Mushariba. Okay, where poets come together and they recite their poetry. Oh, different. no, no, no. Oh. no, 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 no. Yeah. So she, she was very popular. So, yeah. So I hope that uh, to some extent <laughs> that uh, answers you. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, and she also writes about romantic. Uh, first, her her usual uh, these poets when they start they start with uh, you know romantic poetry, talking about passion of love and feelings, and so that was very popular and unusual. Yes, yeah. again, but I haven't answered Amal's question, which about her father's interference in her. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah. Go, go ahead. That's an important question. And then we have a question from Elena. So, Elena, just go ahead after Shireen has answered. Yeah, uh, I'll just answer because I, I haven't thought about this issue so much. It's about, uh, you know, she is still under the influence of her parents as a, I think she is very, um, I did not go into those examples because then as I was talking about Afzal Khan and uh, Fazi Afzal Khan, uh, who writes, uh, who also talks about how she has, uh, she straddles in between the two cultures, Fazi Afzal Khan being, uh, she has settled in the United States for a long, and then she travels across the continents. But with Malala, it is different. She is very much, I agree with you that she, for her, she tries to keep her, uh, the image that she is still a very, as I said, she, from a reading of her book, I gathered that she tries to maintain her, a close affinity with her cultural roots through her dress codes through, and also through her family and Perhaps uh, she is not. She does not want to portray that image that she is. She dresses very um, traditionally, mm -hmm. very conservatively, and mm -hmm. she still is. I, in my view, she's very much under. Whether she wants to do away with the influence of the family, the parental influence, or or she wants, she does it willingly. But yes, her father has been. And uh, but then there's another point, another way of looking at it. If it had not been for her father, she would not have had that education in a place like Swat Valley. It was a very small town in Swat Valley where she was educated by her father. Mm -hmm. So I think there is that the negative and as, as, as the positive side because it was only, although his influence is um, there and is very visible, but yet she has been uh, able to get to this um, level of education, the level of exposure and training. It's only because her father was a, um, is a political activist himself. He was a socialist. He belongs to the Socialist Party. I, I think it's in the book also she, she, when she mentions her father. And so he was adamant that uh, his daughter would be educated. Mm -hmm. So then we must give the father the credit. But then in one of her interviews, she does admit, I saw her, inter I'm very much interested in this girl because it's very unusual the, the way her confidence and her conviction in her beliefs and the way she comes, uh, she is so outspoken about her um, desire for education and for girls' education. Uh, she speaks so, with so much conviction. 
that it's very unusual for uh, at the uh, for a girl of that age to speak to those heads of states and to speak to those i mean she's very, far better than most of our politicians i would say as a mm -hmm. uh, as an icon of so she was she's very keen also herself to retain her cultural identity yeah elena yeah. please thank you very next, much Karine. next question please okay okay yeah. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shirin, for your illuminating uh, speech. And uh, um, I'd just like to, to ask a question about uh, graffiti artists mm -hmm. and uh, the, the popularity of these graffiti artists in the peripheries you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, among girls. Uh, and I suppose that, uh, of course, uh, girls in the peripheries are not so much involved in uh, higher education so is this kind of art in a way uh, spurring them to uh, to start uh, being involved in, in new projects? And is there any support by women's associations to this kind of art, uh, just as a, as a way to, to raise awareness among girls and women in these areas? By the way, I, I, I didn't introduce myself. I am talking from Italy, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I teach history in institutions of the Muslim world at the Catholic University of Milano. So it was uh, really a pleasure to, to listen you. to your uh, to your speech. And uh, thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank you for attending and thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah it's question. in the... Uh, uh, Shireen, that question is also also shared by Nisreen Ali, so it's really good that uh, mm. uh, okay, Elena please. took this question. The, feet, the question was whether these, yes, they are using this art to mobilize these women and girls. And uh, interestingly, initially, usually it's the perception that these women's movements are are dominated by westernized elitist women in Pakistan. In, because of the, the way they are educated, they have exposure to feminist thoughts, feminist theories, um, feminist agendas. But these are now reaching to the grassroots level through these artists and through these art forms. So uh, the way they are using this art to mobilize and to educate women. And it is interesting that initially, yes, there's always starts with the upper class women, but it's so quick that this has caught up with the grassroots level at the same time. I mean, it only started in 2018. Now this new women's movement, which, is, which I am talking about and I'm researching on, it started only in 2018. By the way, I'm looking at something as I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the semiotics, but I'm also looking at the linguistic slogans and language, how it is used. And mm -hmm. but anyway, that's a separate issue. Yeah, it only, but then it started with the elitist women and in three, two major, two or three major cities like Lahore, Rawalpindi and Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad and Karachi. And suddenly three, four years and it has gained a, um, a popularity and it's reached out to the um, women of all classes in, in urban centers and as well as smaller cities and towns like uh, interior in Sakhar, for instance, in Multan, which is so traditional, so it's a conservative city in where I have lived uh, for three decades almost. Uh, and it's a very conservative town city. But it has reached to these places and it has mobilized these women from all walks of life. It's also the, like for my data, I interviewed a woman who belongs to the fishermen community, fisher, I mean, so far, fishing community, I would say not fishermen community, fishing community in from Karachi. Uh, and so also women from all walks of life, they, 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 they have been through art and through other forms of uh, art. And particularly I did not, couldn't mention everything. I spoke to the performing artist, Shima Kermani, who is a very, who's a founding member of Pakistan's women's movement, not just this movement, she started it way back in, it's called Tehreek-e Tehreek Niswa, which is women's movement in Pakistan, which started way back in the late 60s. And she's also founding member of the women's, this Aurat March in Karachi chapter. And she is a performing artist and she says that she uses this art form, the art form of a dance to 
um, educate the people and uh, women in particular and to mobilize them to bring them to these marches and to raise awareness so i think this has been um, whether these uh, whether women's uh, uh, shazil malik whose art i showed and cited she is associated with women's march these women's marches for past four or five years but i'm not sure i have to research more i'm not sure whether the women uh, foundation their women organization are they funding them or sponsoring them to uh, promote their art thank you thank you very much thank you very much for you thank you so much so very interesting and this uh, this conversations and these questions they make it all the more interesting there's a very important uh, comment uh, from amina i think uh, where where is amina <laughs> Amina, yes, please. Can you can you just read it quickly, and then we will close on this. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't think. Uh, I read that. I I read that. You see, Amina, it is it is a very short time, and we already um, people have. I think uh, I published a paper. If you want to read it, I can send you. Uh, I can send to Hatun. Send it to me, and I'm. I and Zahia, I'll share. As actually, Mera Jisn Meri Marzi. You. It's my body, my child. It's titled my word. The slogan was yes, as and I published. Uh, it's only come out this year, 2022. So, mm -hmm. about this slogan, the entire is about linguistic contestations yeah. of women's rights in Pakistan. So I'll send you because it's too short a time to yeah. address no, this question. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. But uh, something just to end end this part of graffiti with. Uh, so Jahizil Malik uh, didn't have a problem of uh in pakistan i mean her work was it allowed or to circulate yeah the thing is this that's what she's her is linked to that question there is a this polarization this oh. huge contestations that are taking place but at least this these women are adamant and they are the government does not stop their marches mm -hmm. the religious clergy say that they should change the slogan they should stop these marches they should not they but uh, the government has not uh, the government is kind of neutral so far so the marches are allowed because they say that according to the constitution of pakistan it is a right of people to i mean if they want peaceful demonstrations or peaceful protests it's only marches mm, okay. so think, they, um, okay. but the, there yeah. is polarizing this very this huge contestations around the slogans as well as these images mm -hmm. maybe not so much about these images because perhaps they do not are uh, not the focus but um, yeah around the slogans there are huge contestations mm -hmm. but women did not change the slogan there were pressures that these are western this a western import the slogan my body my choice but they changed mm -hmm. it they indigenized it so, <laughs> yeah we can talk yeah. some other time about that Thank you so much, Shane. I think we, we, we need to take another question or another two questions. Aida, you haven't spoken before. Uh, could you please ask your question? And then Amal, you 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 follow. So we mm -hmm. you will get two questions at once. Uh, and then this will okay. be the last okay. questions. Okay. We are really out of time now. So, uh, Aida, yes. introduce yourself as well, please. Okay, so uh, uh, Nin, first of all, uh, I would like to thank um, the organizing committee for this important meeting. I also want to thank the speaker for her pertinent lecture. Um, uh, my name is Aziza O'Brien, professor of English at Rabat University in Morocco. Um, the topic is very interesting, but it's part of my research, my thesis that was uh, published 2020 and the, the title are Fem Moroccan female religious agents, old practices and new perspectives. So I also studied the archives, particularly Moroccan archives, searching for feminist um, historic and I, I selected uh, or I limited my research, particularly to women and women saints. Uh, mm -hmm. as an example of female religious agents, the way they can these strong religious personalities that impacted their communities and marked history with their legacy. And the way they are received now by Moroccan feminists, 
Okay, so part of um, historical women important legacy, okay, they are not well known among modern Moroccan women and particularly among, uh, among uh, Moroccan feminist activists. My question uh, is, uh, I would like uh, the speaker to tell us how these Pakistani historical female Okay, like uh, Malala that you have mentioned, okay, received by uh, modern uh, Pakistani feminist activists. Mm -hmm. So, does or did her as the legacy has a great impact on the Pakistani uh, uh, feminist movement now? And thank you so much for uh, your lecture. Thank you, Aziza. Okay, I'm on now. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I wanted to say that it is so wonderful to see all these women artists and writers and poems. But I would like to know, like, um, if there is an impact of all this that is that they are doing on society and as well on the the government, you know, the the political laws and all in the mm -hmm. benefits of women. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, first question, whether there are any linkages between um, Malala's um, work and the feminist movement. I don't think there is a direct linkage as such, or maybe I am not aware of, or maybe there is more research to be done about that. But I am researching um, the women. The question wasn't, wasn't, uh, the question was, uh, what is the reaction of the... I thought uh, it was about the reaction of the pop, the, women, the feminist activists. movement, and how was she perceived by the feminist movement in Pakistan? Oh yes, uh, is well, it the same I, as I would, the rest of the public? I think she is perceived very positively uh, by the. Um, I mean, if I can uh, speak for myself and the rest, um, like-minded, because I I am not an activist as such. I am a researcher, mainly an academic and a researcher. Uh, researching on women's activism in Pakistan at the moment, and also women writers and researchers. Yeah. So how is she perceived? I guess this in the liberal segments, and I assume that uh, the women's marches, uh, the activists behind women's marches and involved with the participants, most of them are very liberal minded. They are perceived as liberal minded. And I, I view myself as liberal minded too. So I, I, I'm part, I consider myself a feminist. Uh, so yeah, so they, they are viewed as positive, but I'm not sure whether there are any direct linkages between what her, she wrote and uh, women's movement agendas or women, but then the agendas, um, the women's manifesto, women's movements manifesto and the polit, um, political, the leg, for legislation about women's rights, and about birth rights, particularly, and and now I'm moving on to Amal's question: whether what's the impact of this movement on mm, the government and the local uh, population? Is that the government and the rest? Sorry, can you what uh, was on the society and the government? On the society as a whole. Yeah, did uh, they change so, the laws? Did they like what happened? About after the memoirs or writings or about the women's movement? What is the I'm sorry, I'm just too many. It's all right, that's all right. Like all these women movements, uh, graphic movement. artists, like poets, writers. Well, there are different things because I, as I said, if you're talking about memoirists and memoirs and writings, not many people are away, even aware of because of the limited access to literacy and higher education. Literacy does not mean that they would read these books, even if they have basic literacy skills. It need, They need to be... Uh, you know, aware of literature, literary writings and stuff. So it's about it, that separate thing. But about women's movement is how the society is polarized about women's movement. So as the society, the liberal segments, the educated women, the, and also some grassroots, at the grassroots le level, women workers, women, um, for instance, um, there was this women workers, like uh, nurses and yeah, uh, medical yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. They, they, there have been movements uh, at the grassroots level as well, not just the elitist movement. But the society is divided and the government is so far, uh, they are fighting for the, the, the women's movement. The women, they have a very uh, defined manifesto and they particularly, as I was talking about you, your, it relates to your earlier question about my body, my, the, the slogan. I think they are arguing for and they want to bring about the legislation about women's right to their bodies and uh, their right to uh, control um, their bodies in the sense that to, about birth control as well. So mm -hmm. my body, my, my body, my choice, it relates to, the, uh, to that mm -hmm. aspect which is kind of controversial in the, in the general society and people have different views, different there's polarization across the board. Thank you. So the Thank government so accepts them, the government accept, allows them to protest and to lead these marches with their manifesto. And they were adamant because they wanted them to change the slogan because they think it's a Western emote and it's, but this uh, hasn't, they, they were adamant that they were not going to change the slogan because they want to talk about their um, birth control rights and the repro rights to reproduction actually. That's there because as I talked to the, one of the founding members, Shima Kermani, who's a performing artist as well, she said that we want to have legislation regarding women's access to their, their, their reproduction rights. And this is their main, so other rights as well. Whether the government is going to accept it and when it's not, uh, I'm not sure about that. But they are regular, they are taking out these protests every year on in March 8th, which is International Women's Day. And they, uh, they're, they're come becoming stronger and stronger and more and more women and more in more cities in all walks of life. They are, they are expanding all over the country. Great. So, Excellent. I think, I think we need to bring this uh, lovely and uh, uh, how can I say, uh, exciting discussion uh, to a close. Uh, so I would, first of all, Thank you, Shireen, uh, for uh, giving this uh, excellent lecture, but also thank you to all of you who have been participating with your comments and your questions and your comments in the chat. And I really like to see this uh, dialogue between us. And uh, obviously, if you want to become a part of this network, if you are not already, do let us have your email. And um, this is how we can take it forward. Shireen? Yeah, I'll write to you later. I would like to see the, I haven't read all the comments yet. So I maybe, and to share the, for yes, Amal, exactly. you, you were yes. interested in the uh, article that on linguistic contestations of the slogan. So yeah, so, yeah. you do very much. Thank, thank you for having the article. <laughs> I want to do so to share with you the uh, next week's, next week's, uh, not next week's, the, the, the next lecture rather. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. And it's going to be by two professors from the University of, U of New Mexico in the United States. We hope to see you there. So if you can take note of that. And really, um, I would say good night. And uh, Hatun, if you want to say anything. Um, I'm, I'm just going to emphasize on the date, uh, which is 15th of November, the time uh, in, in the UK has changed. So when we say 5 uh, p.m., um, you need to see the equivalent now because the differences became, became uh, three hours uh, back. Uh, For those who are not in the UK. In the yes. So the so, English summer time is finished now. We are back into GMT. So five mm -hmm. o'clock is five o'clock. And not five o'clock plus one hour, uh, which we had we had confusion about last week. Thank you so much, everyone. So we hope to see you again, and maybe one day we will meet in the real world. All the best. <laughs> Who knows? Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you.